Are my reasons for rejecting the theory of evolution merely arguments from incredulity? That is, do I reject the theory of evolution by natural selection as an explanation for all current living things just because it's hard to believe? Hello, Roddy Bullock here, founder of Creation Reformation and your host for today's video where I will address this issue. I am often accused by evolutionists as simply making an argument from incredulity and it's time to put that notion to rest. Let's go. At Creation Reformation, we assert and defend a statement that we call the natural selection paradox and here it is. Every current living thing evolved from a first life form solely by cumulative random evolutionary change. Now, if you ponder that statement for a moment, you will realize that if this is a true statement, it completely destroys the theory of evolution by natural selection as a scientific explanation for all current living things. And I am asserting that this must be a true statement if evolutionary theory is true. That is, if the theory of evolution by natural selection is the true account for all current living things, then this statement must be true. But this statement cannot be defended scientifically, thus the paradox, the natural selection paradox, because despite natural selection's role in nature, this statement must be true. Now, if you would like a full explanation for how we derive the natural selection paradox, I invite you to go to our YouTube channel and look for these YouTube videos. Videos. In each of these videos, we give a full, rational, logical explanation for how we arrive at the natural selection paradox, why it must be true if evolutionary theory is true, and the implication for evolutionary theory, which is, of course, devastation. In addition, if you would like to see recaps of dialogues we've had with evolutionists on this issue, you can look for these videos and this Substack post. In each of these, we give a recap, often verbatim, of dialogues we've had evolutionists where they try to defend the theory of evolution and, of course, fail. Now, on this question about the natural selection paradox and our rejection of evolutionary theory, here is the question that we are facing. We are asserting that if evolutionary theory is true, this statement, the natural selection paradox, must also be true. Now, the question of the truth of the natural selection paradox either sinks the theory of evolution or lets it live for another day. So let's start with this question right here. Is the natural selection paradox a true statement? Now, most people looking at this statement and using common sense and life experience would say there's no way that's a true statement. It just seems uh, clearly impossible to be true. So often uh, evolutionists will start down the path of no, this is not a true statement. And when they do, we ask the next logical question, can you explain why it is not a true statement? So we say, just do it. Explain to us why this is not a true statement. And here's something very remarkable that may not be intuitively obvious to you as a video, as a, a listener and watcher of this video. In fact, it can't be done. The amazing thing about the natural selection paradox is that it is a true statement if the theory of evolution is true, as remarkable as that seems. So we can quickly dispose of this question because evolutionists can never explain why this statement is false if the theory of evolution is true. Now, more remarkable than that, is many very knowledgeable evolutionists who watch our videos and see our reasons for deriving the natural selection paradox, as you see it here, have no problem with the truth of the statement and they come into the discussion agreeing with us that yes, this statement is true if the theory of evolution is true. And when we get to this point, here is where the discussion gets interesting because then we ask a very simple question. Is there a scientific law or principle or a law of physics or chemistry that can explain how this statement is true? In other words, how cumulative random mutations alone produced every current genetic code from a first genetic code? That's the question we're asking. What is the scientific basis for this statement being true? Specifically, what scientific law or principle or law of physics or chemistry can render it scientifically tenable? Now, for those of you who are immediately wanting to jump into a discussion of natural selection, let me remind you of two things. Number one, natural selection is not a scientific law or principle. It's not a law of physics or chemistry. Second, you'll recall that as we introduced the natural selection paradox, we made it clear that it is true independent of the operation of natural selection. The natural selection paradox can be worded as we did at the beginning of this video, despite natural selection's role in nature. In other words, whether natural selection operates or not, this statement is true. So when we get to this question, uh, many evolutionists will answer this question, yes, and then we ask, okay, then identify it. Identify the scientific law or principle that operates to make this a true statement. And of course, when we ask 
evolutionists to identify a scientific law or principle and explain how it works, it will not be surprising to find out that they, in fact, can't do it. It's quite remarkable. In a few moments, we are going to look at an actual dialogue that I had with an evolutionist to illustrate this point. I hope you will stick with me. This was a professor of biology and chemistry who attempted to answer this question, yes, and it's quite remarkable how he did it. We'll get there in a moment. But then we are left with the only other pathway in this inquiry, and it's no. And so when we get to this point, we say, if there's no scientific law or principle or law of physics, then what is the scientific basis for believing this statement is true? It's quite a simple inquiry on our part. We are simply asking for what is the scientific reason for believing this can be true? And that question is almost always met very often, including with the evolutions that I spoke of earlier, this professor. We are met then with this accusation that ours is simply an argument from incredulity. Evolutionists are reduced to this response because what they want to say is this statement is true and it must be true because evolution is true and we just have to believe that. And when we say we don't, because we're looking for a scientific basis, then this is the accusation we get. And the question is, is this an argument from incredulity to simply ask for a scientific basis? And here we have an AI overview of what an argument from incredulity is. And let's read it quickly. It's an argument uh, that which state that something is false because it's difficult to imagine being true and they are generally considered invalid. And we agree with that. This is a valid response in logic to someone's rejection of an argument, but it says it's generally considered invalid. However, they can be valid when used in conjunction with other premises that are strong, well supported by evidence, or when they highlight a lack of evidence for the claim. So let's look at this and let's look at whether our uh, whether our request for a scientific basis for believing this statement is true is actually an argument from incredulity, okay? Let's look at this first part, difficult to imagine it being true. Because in fact, there are some ideas, including ideas in science that are simply nonsensical. And the history of science uh, illustrates this. And if you look at the history of science, there are very often theories that are brought up that later and because of the opposition of other scientists are shown to be nonsensical. Some ideas are self-evidently false and some ideas are impossible to imagine. Now, if we look at this first reason for a, uh, an argument from incredulity, I will admit that in, there is a sense in which our rejection of this statement as being true is based on it simply being nonsensical. This is a completely nonsensical statement on its face. Now, let me illustrate that, okay? There is a basis for us saying that. This statement has a direct analog in the computer world. When we say every current living thing evolved, what we're saying is every current living thing has a, comp has a code inside, a genetic code, a true code that is exactly in concept, identical to a computer code to build it. And it evolved, it, it, it changed over time from the first code in, a, in an organism solely by cumulative random evolutionary change. Okay, let me, let me explain a direct analog in the computer world. What if you were told that every current species of coded programs on your computer today, every one of them came about, arose on your computer by cumulative random changes to some first coded program, some first simple coded program of mysterious origin. Nobody knows where it came from. It just appeared uh, on a computer somewhere. And over time, by cumulative random changes, we now have all current species of coded programs. We could even throw in an inspector, for example, in this state, in this stage right here, that would eliminate some of the randomness, but everything that goes through is random. You would rightly reject this as impossible to imagine, and it's based on observation and analogy. So our rejection of this statement, we could say, is based on observation and analogy, okay? That's why one reason we can reject this statement as being true, and if it, uh, you know, if it uh, draws a, an accusation of arguments from incredulity, then that's okay, because some ideas simply are nonsensical. Now, what about if we go to this statement right here? However, they can be valid. Okay, let's look at this statement. Some ideas can be rejected because of other premises that are strong and well supported by evidence. Now, we're going to look at this and we're going to look at it in the, in the uh, context of a very well supported by evidence law, scientific law, that is in exact opposition to this statement having any scientific basis. And that is the law of the, sec the second law of thermodynamics. Now, there is a lot to be said about this law. This law can be uh, stated in complex ways depending on the particular discipline of science it's being uh, applied to. But the idea of the second law of thermodynamics that is well supported, non-controversial, and never contravened is the idea that in a closed system like this beaker, if there was some order, like if all of the molecules of red dye happened to be introduced in one side of this beaker, 
if left alone without any energy uh, uh, input or any guided directed uh, systems, this would diffuse to a, to a state of more disorder. So the second law of thermodynamics basically says that in a closed system, uh, without any directed energy input and directed energy systems, a system will always tend to more disorder. Of course, this statement is saying the exact opposite, that in an unguided system of cumulative random evolutionary change, more order is imposed. Now, Evolutionists will always, always, always dismiss this with some discussion about the sun in our solar system. They will say the earth is not a closed system and the sun is constantly pouring energy into the system. And let me just say, without a lot of elaboration here, this is, uh, this is simply a false uh, a false way to look at the uh, second law of thermodynamics. Let's include the sun in our system. Let's include the whole solar system. Let's include the whole universe as our system the second law of thermodynamics will still hold. And it does not, uh, there is, the, bringing the sun into the system does not eliminate the second law of thermodynamics as a strong and well-supported evidence against this statement. Now, I have written on this, if you want to go to my Substack page and look for a post called the second law of thermodynamics, a natural evolution killer, you will find all my reasons for this. And I completely dispose of this argument that the sun somehow rescues evolution from the second law of thermodynamics. In addition, there are rare evolutionists and atheists who understand and recognize that the second law of thermodynamics is a very big problem for the theory of evolution. For example, Paul Davies wrote a book, The Fifth Miracle. I would urge you to go see it. He is one of the few people writing on this topic who actually recognizes the second law of thermodynamics as a problem for evolution in general. And I'm saying it is a it is strong and well-supported evidence against this statement being true. Okay, let's move on. What about a, uh, you know, highlight a lack of evidence for a claim? Some ideas can be rejected because of because of, well, sorry, I've got some a typo here, a lack of evidence for the claim. Recall our little uh, analog here. There is absolutely no evidence that can be marshaled for any claim that says all current species of computer programs arose over time from a first program by cumulative random changes. There's simply no evidence for a claim like that. And in the direct analog to evolution, we would say there is no evidence for such a claim here as well. And again, it doesn't matter if you put an inspector in the system. Let's say we put an analog of natural selection in, somebody who's looking at these cumulative random changes and removing some of them. Everything that goes through remains a cumulative random change. So if we go back to our little flow here, we see that what we are asking here is in fact not an argument from incredulity. We're not saying we just don't believe this statement is true. There's a sense in which we're saying that, but we are also asking for more. We're asking for a scientific basis to make this a scientifically tenable statement. Now, I told you we were going to look at an actual dialogue I had with an evolutionist, and let's go there now. Here is an email I received from an evolutionist. This evolutionist happened to be a professor. In fact, he is not just a professor. He is a PhD in molecular biology, and he's a current college-level professor of chemistry and biology. He started in the comment section of a Facebook post we had, and then we moved over to email so that he and I could dialogue uh, independently of Facebook. And this was the first email that he sent me. And let me uh, set this up by saying that he was uh, reacting to a video that I referred to earlier called the silver bullet. So he watched the silver bullet and he sent this email as his response to what we say in the silver bullet, where we specifically put forth five propositional statements to support the natural selection paradox. And if you want to find a full verbatim recap of my interaction with this professor of biology and chemistry, you can look for a video called the theory of evolution by natural misconception. But let's go. Again, here was his first email. You can see that he addresses our first claim right here. He addresses our second claim right here. Uh, somewhere down here is the, uh, here's the third and fourth. So he's addressing our five propositional statements. In the uh, video recap, you can see where we dispose of all four of these uh, oppositions that he has, and we show that he is in fact wrong, which is the way these normally go. But what I want to draw our attention to here is the fifth claim. Now in this video, the fifth claim was the natural selection paradox, reworded uh, or worded slightly differently. We, we said every current species at that time in that video. Today, we're saying every current living thing, but the, in concept, it's the same argument with the same result. So this professor is addressing this claim, and let's look at what he said because it's quite remarkable. He says here, the concluding assertion 
that there are no natural laws or scientific principles to explain how new species could arise from such a process is demonstrably false, okay? He is uh, saying this in response to our question, our inquiry, our request for any scientific law or scientific principle that could make the natural selection paradox true. He believes it's true, and he believes it supports the theory of evolution by natural selection. So he is addressing here, he is saying our concluding assertion there are no natural laws or scientific principles, he says that's demonstrably false, okay? We are open to that. Show us, show us a scientific law or a scientific principle that is, is, uh, is applicable here. He continues, evolutionary biology is supported by extensive empirical evidence. Now let me stop on this term empirical evidence for a moment because empirical evidence is evidence from observations. It's objective evidence that everybody can see. And we admit and we agree that empirical evidence is important in science. In fact, it is indispensable in any scientific inquiry. But empirical evidence is not a scientific principle and it is not a natural law, okay? So he says that it's demonstrably false that, we, that there are no natural laws or scientific principles to uh, render the natural selection paradox a true statement and in his attempt to show that he goes to empirical evidence that's quite interesting okay more interesting is that he goes down this list genetics fossil records developmental biology comparative anatomy and observed instances every one of these are indeed uh, observations that we see in nature but let me stop here to say two things one these are not natural laws or scientific principles that's one thing and second it is the conceit of evolutionists to believe that things like genetics only support the theory of evolution in fact, genetics, and, and what we know from genetics is one of the strongest inferences we have for a designer in nature. And if the inference is only getting stronger day by day. The fossil record did not support evolution in Darwin's day. Darwin admitted it, and it has not changed fundamentally in what it is today. The fossil record is, in fact, not evidence for evolution by natural selection. It's incredible that he lists all these things. Developmental biology and comparative anatomy, none of these things are sole evidences for the theory of evolution as if they prove evolutionary theory alone. Every one of these can be, can be used identically and objectively to support, for example, creation by God. So it's just interesting that he lists all these things. But again, more interesting is that none of these are scientific principles or natural laws. And then he goes on to say something quite remarkable, very revealing. He concludes with this statement. It does not require a scientific principle or law in order to be accurate. You see what's happening here. This is, this is really surprising for a professor of biology and chemistry to say. He starts out by saying that our assertion there are no laws or scientific principles are, is demonstrably false. Then he goes on to demonstrate that it's actually true. He cannot marshal a scientific law or natural law to support the natural selection paradox being true. He is reduced to empirical evidence, and then he says it does not require scientific principle or law. Okay, well, excuse us if we do not buy this statement. We actually would like a scientific law or a natural law that gives a scientific basis for the natural selection paradox being a true statement. So when we get here, we are going to reject your accusation that ours is an argument from incredulity, and we are going to stick with this statement as being true if uh, evolutionary theory is true. And of course, because it is absurd, the theory of evolution by natural selection cannot be a scientific basis for every current living thing. Okay, so let's come to the end here. Let me just make a few statements about this. If you cannot show us a scientific law or principle that makes this statement scientifically tenable, then this statement remains the absurdity that it appears on its face. But like we said, this statement must be true if evolutionary theory is true. So if you cannot show how this statement is true in some scientific way, and you continue to believe the theory of evolution by natural selection created you, then you are not believing a scientific basis for your belief or you do not have a scientific basis for your belief. You are believing a faith belief. You might even be believing in magic. But in any event, do not claim that your belief in the theory of evolution by natural selection is based on science because it's not. For everyone else, I would hope that you would join me in rejecting the theory of evolution by natural selection as an explanation for all current species, including you. Now, I will end here by drawing your attention to this website, naturalselectionparadox.com, where you will find more information. And in addition, if you like what you've heard here, if you would uh, like to join us in our effort to take back the creation narrative, I would note that we have a Patreon account and you can, uh, despite the typo here, go to Creation Reformation at patreon.com and become a monthly supporter of Creation Reformation. If you do so, you might be the first. I hope you do. In any event, at this point, I am going to say goodbye and good day.